Well, we've been repeatedly informed that Europe's 20th century experiments with multiculturalism are over. And as you know, um, a version of the history of my country and a version of this one, of the history of this one, circulate very prominently in rationalizations of that negative verdict. We're told that the governmental initiatives aimed at managing plurality failed for a number of reasons. The first layer of explanation emphasizes that any immigrant or foreigner or immigrant descended person can become a treacherous terrorist. After that, there's a sustained focus on the idea that the disenchanted, always white, um, sometimes the language of indigeneity is used, but the working class is, claimed to be, is claiming to have been cheated out of its civic patrimony. Avowedly moderate governments profess great concern that their authentic and indigenous citizens are being propelled into the arms of the ultra-nationalist right by what are, at root, legitimate grievances held against unwanted incomers who stole the jobs, polluted the streets, and diverted uh, political entitlements into devious judicial schemes designed to secure preferential treatment. If there are anti-discrimination laws, that's the way that they're seen. And this, of course, is a, is a populist pitch, which has worked very well to secure electoral blocks in several different places. It's more disturbing that avowedly new varieties of social and political theory converging on the concepts of social capital and social cohesion are being created now to endorse and to disseminate this culturalist hypothesis. And of course, this change of orientation towards integration is found in numerous settings. It's found in different kinds of uh, political systems where different sorts of issues would have been done. It's found where there's a Republican model, it's found with, um, um, in Germany, it's found in Britain too, everywhere. Whatever background, from whatever citizenship law, there's a convergence around the idea of integration as a crisis of Europe. And this change too, I think, corresponds to the fortification of Europe against the encroachments of the global south, and of course to the idea that we're now in the grip of a clash of civilizations. A view, incidentally, that I recall being very popular and very influential in this country long before September the 11th, 2000. From my perspective, the misguided political schemes that were responsible for the un unmanageable multiculture that followed post-colonial immigration, they failed because the cohesion of Europe's besieged national states is now supposed to depend upon a high degree of sameness the timely fantasy that uh, national communities require a sort of hyper-similarity has taken hold. And that focus on integration has intensified. This gloomy belief is associated with the idea that cultural homogeneity can somehow offset the antisocial effects of economic and social inequality, which are known. Homogeneity has become then uniquely precious and functional. It's seen either as a precondition for the mutuality on which our dwindling social models depend, or as some sort of essential part of the overdue reforms required by neoliberal uh, thought and by a process of globalization as Americanization. At a deeper level, we're also informed that these experiments have failed because of cultural relativism, failed because of political correctness, which is taught, hopefully, universities like this, places where um, um, solid judgments are nihilistically affirmed, uh, uh, where solid judgments are traduced, and where the destruction of authentic values, like the destruction of disciplinary boundaries, um, indeed, like the destruction of civilization <coughs> itself is being quietly celebrated. Um, the philosophically grounded but mistaken refusal to stand up for our historic values in the face of their corruption and their betrayal, has taken a great toll. However, the state of emergency in which we live and the global reach of US culture makes those values increasingly hard to specify, and even harder to project in anything like a consistent manner. Indeed, the context of a kind of neo-imperial military adventure makes those very values appear to be tarnished. Promoting them often sounds like a an attempt to answer the charge that our universal standards are nothing but a sort of 
thin as an historical achievement, something that's too readily compatible with the exigencies of imperialism and racial hierarchy, things that are being recast around us in culturalist forms as xenology, as immigrant pathology, and as Islamophobia. Governments feel, I think, that though Europe's outsiders may have been nominally integrated, they haven't been assimilated at the urgent rate that present circumstances require. And here, I think we need to distinguish between what we might think of as an essentially economic mode of incorporation and the more elaborate mechanisms of social and cultural integration and assimilation, which are desired. Those terms, integration and assimilation, presuppose particular ways of thinking about culture as difference. They promote a common view of the mechanisms of cohesion, of the value of solidarity, and, above all, of the degree of sameness that are thought to be essential once national communities are viewed as primarily cultural rather than political in character, and identity is seen as fixed rather than as something protein. The consequent promotion of what Mahmoud Mamdani calls culture talk refers us not to a world of conflicting ideas and ideologies, but to a sort of shadow land of nebulous values which can become momentarily embedded in ciphers of cultural difference. And now, after what we might call the UNESCO interlude, that decisive difference is imagined just as it was in the 19th century. It is absolute, it is natural, it is geopolitical, it is civilizational, and it is unbridgeable. Cultural diversity, then, is always suspect, if not illegitimate. Culture is what minorities have. It's always a kind of subculture. And it is here, I think, um, uh, in a sense, becoming opposed to civilization, although not in the 19th century in way they were opposed. The accommodation of cultural plurality and peace becomes as unthinkable as the practical reconciliation of solidarity with diversity. Indeed, plurality and diversity, which are often merely coded terms for racialized and ethnic variation and hierarchy, now involve risks. We are obliged to recognize those phenomena, plurality and diversity, as potential sources of catastrophic violence. And the rewritten political conventions of the secure national state dictate that a stable polity can only ever comfortably accommodate monoculture brittle, invariant, and immobile, yet in these conditions, solidarizing. These assumptions about the optimal relationship between culture and nationality have other consequences. They specify that the ways in which people form and reproduce the social groups to which they imagine they belong derive from an essential disposition to associate positively only with those they see as already like themselves. An underlying tendency towards sameness trumps all other social processes. And in the context of what we might call an emergent securitocracy, securitocracy, not just security, but securitocracy, ruling through security, not through freedom, through security, um, this tendency, of course, combines easily with the resurgence of cultural nationalism, kind of absolutism which people imagine will protect them from the storm of globalization and the carelessness of life. Creating a mixture in the process that's proved to be very combustible, I think, particularly when politicians, and by, here, by this I mean politicians from all political backgrounds and ideological directions, strive to recode the populist instincts to which that deep yearning for solidarity remains captive. And of course it's identity which supplies the watchword for all the clustering that's now required in order to feel safe, in order to feel secure. Insecure nations must be bonded anew. But if the immigrants attempt any similar defensive maneuvers, their communities, and this is the language of social capital, must be bridged, must be ventilated, in order to secure a kind of national cohesion. Ossified and instrumentalized culture becomes insulated from the manifold pressures of history, from the tempo of everyday accommodation and creativity. 
So in this, a, a disciplinary form, then, I suppose we could say that identity effectively captures us, pickling people, marking them forever as this or that, as sheep or goat. And national groups are invited in those conditions to take possession of their absolute culture, the inert object that distinguishes them. They're required to hold it as if it was itself a form of property. Absolute culture becomes enthralling. It reduces citizens to transient elements in a longer story of political ontology, uh, of national and racial character, which is maintained in simple functional harmony with what I call the ecologies of belonging that are supposed to distinguish Europe's authentic national states. Of course, the recurrence of these motifs is a small but I think a telling part of a depoliticizing mechanism which inflates and amplifies contemporary culture talk in the unique setting provided by officially endorsed fantasies of long-term conflict. And the repetition of these ideas, their emergence as a kind of common sense explanation of the history of the present, conveys the secure autocracy's version of geopolitics as a cultural conflict, defined simultaneously by race and religion and ethnicity. That common sense analysis is circulating now as part of what we would have to call it the info war. Well, reflection on the ideal relationship between culture and nationality has a very long pedigree. Um, I can't give the genealogy here, but I will suggest, um, perhaps contentiously, that that um, conversation culminates in the projection of what I would call the racial nomos, um, a racialized organization of law and space as the natural, inevitable fate of humankind. Of course, the history of this idea is an interesting one. It receives its modern, initial modern imprimatur in the subjugation of Europe's first colonies. It's refined over time in the colonial and imperial periods in which European countries dominated the life of the planet. However, the version of that tacitly racialized government currently favored in my country, in Britain, if not always favored elsewhere in Europe, let me add, corresponds most closely to the patterns of racial and ethnic segregation and hierarchy that come to us from the history of the United States. Those techniques are seldom seen as the results of settler colonialism, as the results of slavery, and genocidal warfare against indigenous people. Instead, I think, the strong attachment of the US polity to racial hierarchy is viewed as a kind of correctable aberration, what Francis Fukuyama and Condoleezza Rice have both recently called America's birth defect. This outcome appears to be as much the result of its victims' natural shortcomings as any injustices perpetrated by its beneficiaries, the descendants of colonial rulers and other incomers who have been admitted into the citadels of white prestige. That disavowed colonial history apart the familiar Manichaean polarization into black and white reveals, I think, a broad contemporary impact of generic racial and cultural categories sourced from the United States. We're disadvantaged, actually, in thinking about these imports and their impact by the fact that academic professionalism is so often defined by a, a great reluctance to analyze racism and exclusion. The refusal to engage racism's impact on contemporary social and political life is now, I think, integral to focusing attention exclusively on cultural dynamics as both problem and solution. Indeed, making racism appear politically trivial and intellectually insignificant is now part of naturalizing the reproduction of racial hierarchy and of folding that ethnic absolutism into the government of national states. Huge amounts of political energy have been expended on elaborate denials of the fact that racism is historically or politically important as such, and in opposing the idea that horrible racism could be connected in any way to the healthy nationalism, the uh, official patriotism, which are going to solve the problem of integration for us. Now, in trying to understand that state of affairs, it helps us. To appreciate the extent to which ideas of racial hierarchy were enmeshed with imperial domination from the very beginnings of European expansion and intrinsic to the makings of Europe's global power 
in several different uh, phases. All of us who write about race and racism in empire are indebted to Hannah Arendt at this point for her brilliant, flawed attempts to link the history of industrialised genocide in Europe to a prehistory in the colonial spaces of death and racialised misrule. She saw this process, I think, with great clarity, in part because she was alert to the significance of racial division and the forms of power it animated, even if for her, racism remained part of the legitimate reactions of civilised Europeans when confronted with savagery. Our end insights remain inspiring, though, because of the way that she refused culturalist views of the politics of racial hierarchy and because of the creativity with which she conceptualised the still unpalatable connections between war, colonial administration, and Europe's uh, uh, genocide of Jews and others. Early ideas about race and what we now call ethnicity were pernicious, even in pre-scientific forms. They were both a tacit and an explicit presence in English political theory, from the days when John Locke first winked at the colonists and gave it the thumbs up to their rules of expropriation. And Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan is published against the backdrop provided by the introduction of the Navigation Acts, which formally initiated the legal and economic consolidation of the British Empire. Um, Peter Leinbau, Marcus Redeker, and others, I think, um, have begun the revisionist historical account, which gives us a different sense, a transnational sense, an Atlantic sense of the formation of those class forces and dispositions. An account which, um, you know, for all its romance, does the job of connecting the uh, diversification of the party debates, the early exchanges of the um, English Revolution, to the life of colonial territories and to the return of that revolutionary heritage to Europe in the wooden world of the ships that brought it back at the end of the 18th century. Now, the history of those English traditions of thought is, I think, also becoming important for us in the genealogies of security and securitocracy that we need, as well, actually, uh, as in the context of de debates over what is now going to count as the proper history of our country in our national curriculum in secondary schools and so on. Conflicts, of course, which are parallel in other post-colonial countries like France and Japan, where there have been similar kinds of arguments about how the history of the nation is going to be taught and narrated, how much of it, what variety of it, the citizens are, need to, are going to need to know if they're going to be able to function um, as politically literate um, agents. Now, I think, uh, and here I speak parochially from England, it would appear that the triumph of our seaborne power and our role in the defeat of the Nazis are not now enough to orient our nation, either for its new military missions in the world or for its properly patriotic and integrated relationship with the sort of ethnically pure version of its heritage which emerges from these um, misleading popular versions of, of World War II which circulate, all very much of the kind of great escape variety, if you remember that film of John Sturgis from the early 60s, the film with the uh, viral theme tune that is uh, still sung, of course, by the England football fans. That's their song. You might need to know why that song, of all the songs they might want to sing, is the one that corresponds most viscerally to their idea of who they are. English traditions of theoretical reflection on the politics and morality of colonial government are also relevant to this. Because a rather self-conscious revival of imperial ambition, as you know, has divided our country. Divided it over the significance of imperialism in its past, as well as the wisdom of reviving that civilizing mission in military form in Mesopotamia, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere. <coughs> as always, our past imperial ambitions were swathed in humanitarian rhetoric. I know you also have this problem. The humanitarian component in colonial adventures, I think, is something that we need to engage more explicitly and historically. Something which remains pending, having been updated and refined in contemporary discussions of debt and conflict resolution, as well, of course, in the struggle uh, to reduce poverty. Proponents of the ideology of civilizational uh, uplift and progress had imagined that the world's unfit and backward peoples were doomed and would simply vanish away with the inevitable global advance of civilization 
And although I suppose there are some readings of what's been going on in Mesopotamia which suggest that some people still think this way, I don't think that many do. But sentiments akin to those have reappeared in our post-colonial world. We hear arguments not against gunboat diplomacy and double standards, but for their extension. For the revival of imperial rule, I'm quoting here Robert Cooper, the EU uh, foreign policy supremo, the one who is now whispering in um, Javier Solana's ear, um, towards uh, the end of reviving imperial rule, I'm quoting Cooper, under the lightest of touches, in postmodern forms, in voluntary forms, that can promote uh, a kind of early intervention in the pre-modern chaos and uh, failed or incompetent government uh, of, um, of these um, infrastates by an enlightened Europe with smart weaponry. Now, these, um, these arguments are not monopolized by the right. And it's really significant that their advocates, from whatever political direction they hail, are untroubled by and sometimes even assertive about their active disinterest in the detail of our country's imperial and colonial history. And indeed, of the histories of colonial rule and colonial war that have involved other European powers. Interventions by the advocates of revived colonial rule, for whom Cooper, I think, supplies a valuable paradigm case, have appeared in tandem with an explosion of popular revisionist accounts of colonial rule. I don't know if there's been anything like that here too. Sort of, uh, uh, you know, a literary historical turn towards those uh, stories. A body of work, I suppose, that's made the history of empire and colony into a very dynamic issue. It's significant, of course, that the leading proponent of this, I don't know um, um, how familiar you are with him, is, is Neil Ferguson, who teaches at Harvard, who has offered this story in which uh, Britain becomes Greece to America's Rome and so on. And uh, well, we won't go too deeply into that analogy, but uh, you can imagine um, how, how, how that particular talos plays out. Anyway, I think that body of work, which has been very, very popular and very, very strong in its impact, has made the history of empire and colony into a very dynamic issue. What we might call happy, clappy approaches to the lost glories of the imperial past have become particularly inspiring in a geopolitical uh, situation where the revival of empire has been explicitly demanded by those who are most keen to, to, um, to link the present power of the US with the global dominance enjoyed by Britain in the past. Those widely read works are interesting. They don't just gloss over the rationally applied barbarity of Britain's colonial phase, uh, phases. The authors, like the same populist politicians I discussed earlier, trade in a significant idea. In the idea that the British are the primary victims of their own colonial history. An awareness that has been judged to be the best precondition for the revival of empire abroad and the rebirth of this homogenous neo-imperial spirit at home. Now I think understood in association with that other article of faith, the refusal to engage racism, the historical significance of this bid to monopolize victimage is revealed by the way that these restorative themes resonate within the arc of Europe's post-colonial crisis, something that's made manifest in the supposed demise of the world. More than that, hostility to multiculturalism and enthusiasm for civilizationism supply the kind of load-bearing pillars for a monumental common sense, which is fully compatible with a deeply and comfortably racialized conception of geopolitical conflict. So it's not only the US special forces who see the Iraqis and the Afghans as untermenschen. Guantanamo uh, can be connected, I think, um, historically and juridically to the suspension of the law in the name of the law, which is carried out in places like our Guantanamo, which is not in the Caribbean actually, it's in South London. Belmarsh has a name. Um, I always think about this when I come through Chiffol Airport um, and remember the struggles there amongst the detained, uh, the nameless, and those who are the victims of uh, law suspended in the law zone name. Um, some of these places have names, I suppose we should name of it. You probably know the name of the place at Chiffon Airport. I don't know it. I just know it's there. 
It's just it was a detention centre, right? Okay. I thought it might have had some. If it was British, it would have some other sort of charming um, rural name like Campsfield House <laughs> or Yarl's Wood. You know, our detention centre. They all suggest this stuff, right? It's like the Shire where the hobbits live. <laughs> Residents, you know, what the names that are given to the place. We wouldn't just call it the Heathrow Airport detention. Although there is one name to um, so, anyway, I mean, my point about, about this is that we are held hostage, we are held hostage, but we're not held hostage by terrorists. We're held hostage by a sort of neurotically intense desire to retain or to refill the painfully empty shell of our fading national identity. And that pain has led many to seek the cultural resources for national renewal and rebirth, not only in the carefully airbrushed accounts of the imperial past I mentioned, but also in the resurgent monarchy. You know, that's what Prince Harry was doing in fighting in Afghanistan, just in case you didn't work that out. Although, on that occasion, he was wearing a British uniform rather than a Nazi one. Um, and, and also, I think, if those options, sport and monarchy, fail in the comforting contours of a very abstract white supremacy, enacted on the battlefield or performed on the streets where other rules of preemption can prevail. The same underlying cultural and psychological pathology, of course, found its most notable expression in Gordon Brown saying this sort of impossibly contradictory declaration, well, on the one hand, we should revive interest um, in what was thought, I think, to be the rather discredited notion of Britishness, and on the other, that all apologising for the empire should now cease. Brown told the Daily Mail, and quoting, Britain no longer had to make excuses for its record as a colonial power, adding, I've talked to many people on my visit to Africa, and the days of Britain having to apologise for its colonial history are over. We should move forward. Well, those of you, uh, you know, the residual literary critic in me is very attentive to that rhetorical displacement um, of the perception onto his eager African interlocutors. Uh, but, so there's a small argument for the virtues of, of multidisciplinarity. We would always, perhaps, reading as a sociologist, we would notice that he's not saying it. He's putting it into the mouths of his African puppets to say it. Okay. Now, I think it bears repetition that this uh, history is a popular appeal, whether it's served by the cheerleaders of empire or perhaps in a more tepid form by those who want to, uh, who are a little uncomfortable with the idea of. Britain playing Greece to the US Rome. Uh, people like Lindsay Collier are put in that category. Uh, this <coughs> lies in the odd way that Brits, rather than the peoples that they slaughtered and exploited and enslaved, emerge as the primary victims of our grand imperial project. And it's really significant, I think, that the broad appeal of this particular combination of themes, Britain's victim, Britain as righteously victorious, is seldom identified as an issue or analyzed at all. And I think that luxury, luxury shouldn't really continue. Because the national obsession with World War II as the site of the most intensely held form of national identity, and the very belligerent forms of nationalism and racism that often go together with that, suggest that a renewed engagement with identity reproduces and perhaps amplifies the symptoms of this malady. I don't know if you know this, but our ultra-right party, our British National Party, they call themselves, has a theoretical journal, and the name of that journal is Identity. Okay? So those of you who lose that term too loosely have none, uh, should be forced to face the responsibility of its importation into their discourse too. They speak a fluent anthropological language, and they took it from some of the things that some of us did. So we, should, we should face up to that. It's not just Paul Raymond Williams who picks up the check for that. Okay. The blend in which the figures of victim and victor are fused, I think, is linked both to the denial of racism and to this sort of fit in or clear out assimilationism, which is so politically favoured. And the uncontrolled repetition of Britain's heroic triumph against the Third Reich serves the machinery of this melancholy as a screen or a filter. It blocks out imperial and colonial history. It prevents access to the wars of decolonization which followed 1945. And the disappearance of all those other nation-building post-colonial conflicts encourages the mistaken belief that the empire was too long ago to remain relevant in contemporary realities. You would think no wars have been fought uh, since 1945. 
Cyprus or Kenya or Malaya or Aden or Africa um, or in Palestine, the Ireland, um, all of this disappears and what we're left with is World War II. Now, <clears throat> Freud says that melancholia is a state of pathological sadness interspersed with manic elation, guilty self-hatred and disgust. Right. He reminds us that this melancholia is a condition of shamelessness. <coughs> shamelessness. But guilt abounds there. The loss that triggers these symptoms will not be worked through. The lost object is gone, but its loss promotes a limitless grief that's expressed in various destructive and self-destructive forms. For Britain, the guilt and the anguish lie in disavowed identification with the empire and its crimes, but that is blocked by the memory of World War II. Perhaps that's familiar to you, I don't know. I hope so. Certainly, knowledge of those crimes is repressed, but the empire can't be let go of. Chicken tikka masala is now a national dish, displacing the fried fish that was introduced by an earlier wave of refugee settlers. Um, of course, we'll see in a few weeks how um, the manipulation in a number of these uh, European nations gets articulated around sports spectatorship. Um, only racism, only anti-racism in the soccer stadium just really fought to liberate that from its complicity uh, with uh, melancholia. It's quite, quite interesting actually to see that manipulation play that. So uh, when, you, when you're all painting your faces orange and uh, putting your um, hats on, you can, uh, you can think about where that manipulation comes when your team are, as they will be, sobbing down on the pitch, you can ask yourself what it is that these men are really crying about. <laughs> now, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to report uh, that largely undetected, uh, either by our government or by our media, our immigrants, um, and the succeeding two generations since the migrant experience, have begun to generate some more positive possibilities. Other varieties of interaction have developed alongside the usual tales of crime and racial conflict. And these patterns emerge not from a sort of mosaic pluralism along US lines in which each self-sustaining and carefully segregated element is located so as to enhance the larger national picture, but with a kind of unruly, what I call convivial mode of interaction, in which differences have to be negotiated in real time. Those of you who were in the earlier session when uh, uh, Professor White was talking this afternoon, might think of the distinction that emerged there between the uh, forms of, uh, of analysis which accentuate the need for a convergent narrative and the forms of, of analysis which accentuate the skills, the different patterns and tempo involved in, in acquiring and managing a shared space in a common time. Okay? And I think sometimes those things go together, but sometimes they're in conflict. And I'm trying to suggest to you that this idea of convivial uh, social interaction is one which is less concerned with shared narrative, much more concerned with shared space and a common present, being in the same, the same present. Differences negotiated in real time. Now, Britain's civic life, I think, is endowed with multiculture. Um, <coughs> it's been endowed with a multiculture that we don't always value and use very well. And in many instances, those convivial social forms have sprouted spontaneously, sprouted unappreciated from the sort of wreckage of failed 1960s experiments with integration. It was really in the middle 60s that we got our anti-discrimination legislation. We got our anti-discrimination legislation then because our Labour government at that time sent its best analysts to Washington at the time that the, that the US cities were on fire, and they returned with the, the idea that they didn't want our country to be like that. And they, they felt that the key to doing that was the introduction of anti-discrimination legislation. Of course, since then, and this is very much a situation in which we are, we're in, we're offered a, a much uh, different account of the relationship between these different cases. One in which America stands for our future. We quarrel among ourselves about whether it's 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years ahead of us now. Um, that's not a view I hold, uh, by the way, but, uh, but it's a very different one which guided this sense in the middle 60s of anti-discrimination, as a key towards equality of opportunity and a refusal of a kind of melting pot um, account of how um, a nation comes to be a nation. Conviviality is a social pattern in which different metropolitan groups dwell in close proximity, 
but where their racial and linguistic and religious particularities do not, as the logic of ethnic absolutism suggests they must, add up to discontinuities of experience or insuperable problems of communication. In these conditions, a degree of differentiation might be combined with a large measure of overlapping. There are institutional and demographic and generational and educational and legal and political commonalities, as well as what we might think of as elective variations that intercut the dimensions of difference and complicate the desire to possess or manage the cultural habits of others as a function of one's own relationship with identity. There's nothing mathematical about identity in this approach. Conviviality acknowledges this complexity, and though it cannot banish conflict, it can be shown, I think, to equip people with a means of managing it in their own interests and in the interests of others with whom they might be induced to identify across cultural lines. Now, recognising conviviality shouldn't, I think, signify the absence of racism. Instead, though, it might convey the idea that alongside those institutional and interpersonal dynamics, the means of racism's overcoming have also evolved. Racism is still there, still souring things, distorting economic life, debasing public life, but it's now articulated together with the kind of ambivalent mainstreaming of minority cultures. And conviviality promotes that odd combination. Plurality starts to mutate into more complex and, I think, challenging forms. Our black community is, for example, shifting away from a Caribbean descending majority um, and towards a very uh, diverse, uh, in religious and linguistic and ethnic terms, African. In this convivial culture, racial and ethnic differences have been rendered unremarkable. In Raymond Williams' distinctive sense of the word, word I think they've become what we would call ordinary. And instead of adding to the premium of race as political ontology, as economic fate, people discover that the things that really divide them are actually much more profound. Taste, leisure, lifestyle, and so on. And what this, how this will be tested by economic recession, I think, is the principal issue. By making racial differences appear ordinary, banal, even boring, this kind of convivial interaction, even when it's promoted by sort of anaesthetic technologies like reality television, has disseminated some everyday virtues that enrich our cities, that drive our cultural industries and enhance our struggling democracy so that it resists operating in colour-coded forms. Well, I think the first conclusion that emerges from this is that the supposedly unbridgeable gulf between cultures and civilizations might be easily spanned. And that epiphany is an interesting thing. It came across um, most pointedly for me and some of the stories that began to be told by the returning detainees uh, who had been incarcerated in the uh, Guantanamo camps, and of course, uh, in, in their attempt to match their experiences there to uh, their uh, life subsequently. And there's quite an archive now in a number of different European languages of these uh, stories from the Guantanamo detainees. In English, we have Morten Beg, um, in Swedish, there's uh, Make de Gazali's book about his incarceration in Guantanamo. Um, I think there's a French one, I haven't looked at that yet. And, um, um, and, and there's also Murat Kona's book, the German book, which is in, in, in English in Germany, Five Years of My Life in Innocent Man in Guantanamo. Um, okay. I was very struck in, in, in beginning to, to, to read, read this uh, emergent archive. Um, uh, obviously, by the case of, of, of Moise and Beg, um, who, you know, I um, don't know how much people know about him, but what's interesting about, about his book, anyway, we don't know about him, what's interesting about his book, Enemy Combatant, is the way in which he narrates his uh, account of his um, uh, relationship with his captors and the ways in which his own life uh, story. Uh, the particular sorts of anthropological and cultural and translation skills that were refined growing up on the streets of Birmingham, which is where he's from, um, become, as he understands it, useful to him in the context of his dialogue with his jailers. Um, Begg tells us um, that he's, of course, held for protracted periods in solitary confinement. The skills that he acquires on the streets have enabled him to make a sustaining dialogue with his guards. More seriously, Beg explains that his father had him and his brother educated in a Jewish school in Birmingham, um, a decision which reveals, uh, amongst other things, um, interesting information about migrancy and assimilation which defy 
some of the more simplistic um, civilizationist uh, uh, notions or the kinds of things we get from imperialist political theology. Let me quote him just very, very briefly. From an early age, um, from an early age, my father enrolled us both at a Jewish primary school. His seemingly odd choice was entirely pragmatic. King David, with his high standards of education and emphasis on religious and moral ethics, coupled with kosher dietary laws similar to our own, was the ideal option for him. Um, but the choice also demonstrated my father's liberalism. His desire to take what was best from all cultures, it laid the foundations for the type of religious teaching uh, that I became so interested in as I grew older." Unquote. Um, interesting that, uh, that that's there. I haven't quite, unfortunately, had a chance to finish reading Murat Kurnan's account. I'm sure some of you will have read it through to the end. I was very struck by his account of his detention in Afghanistan, his movement through uh, Diego Garcia and other places. Um, and he describes his experience of being incarcerated by uh, the US. Um, they put an armband on me, he goes on. There was a number on it, 061. It was green, made of plastic. It's a nice place, said one of the soldiers who'd taken hair and saliva samples from me. Lots of trees. Trees, were they making fun of me? He pointed outside the tent. The tent door was open. I couldn't see any trees. I saw hills, hills and sand and cacti, big cacti. There aren't any trees where cacti grow. Do you know why you're here? I heard the man with the name tag ask. Do you know what the Germans did to the Jews, he said. That's exactly what we're going to do with you. Now, I don't want to get carried away with this, but it's interesting. It's not me making that comparison. It's not me making that comparison. It'll be absolutely clear that I think there are ethical uh, issues involved in the terms under which that comparison might be made. What's interesting to me is that it's the, it's the uh, according to the, 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 the author of this, it's the James that they And I think that is something um, which is interesting. It suggests a certain uh, breadth um, um, of formation in which that particular history becomes meaningful to our detail, and he too wants to invoke it, albeit at a distance one remove in the context of understanding his own fate. Um, the lives of the bombers of 7th July and 25th July, and of their victims too, I think, fall into very different categories than those of these returnee stories, which I've collected quite a few. But they also, I think, might be read in ways that yield resources with which to illustrate and to explain some of the social characteristics of convivial interaction. The multilingual and cosmopolitan victims um, have become, I think, reasonably well known. We know much about their lives. I suppose like the, the sorts of biographies of the people that died in the World Trade Center, which were presented as a sort of exemplary snapshot of a, of a, of a, of a world city, really. And those biographies, those names, those faces have become known in a process of, of public mourning, public grieving, but I think I want to contrast very sharply the kind of melancholic pattern I described earlier on. Um, I think it would be wrong to assume that the murders of those people represented nothing more than another view of the opposition between solidarity and diversity. We have to find a better way of reading and using these intercultural uh, contexts and um, crossing points. A more difficult point still would be to point out, uh, to underline, that nobody involved in these events seemed to have lived comfortably bounded by the culture officially assigned to them, by the language, religion, race or history from which we are, are, are told that they would be unable to escape. Indeed, even the bombers involved seem to have had considerable problems in conforming to the rules of ethnic absolutism that they had chosen. Their manichaeism and delirium might be also read as a response, and not just to the injuries of racism, but also to culture's protein qualities and convivial aspects. And why, why else would the young man have gone and eaten his last meal at McDonald's before going to kill him, for example? The idea that the ongoing effects of racism and exclusion might even now be inclining some people towards the forms of solidarity that are found in occult groups, fundamentalist quote-unquote political groups, priming some people for the seductions of that occultism or conspiracy theory or political Islam, Islam remains rather undiscussed. And those bodies of thought, I think, do supply powerful sources of certainty in a political and economic and technological environment where anxiety and insecurity are the dominant social characteristics. In fact, 
I'd go so far as to suggest a profound and significant family resemblance between those attachments and those groups, and the sorts of things that we find amongst the um, uh, ultranationalist um, groups, all the groups, I suppose, that suggest a sort of palingenesis, um, uh, a process of rebirth and, and uh, reconstruction after a phase of weakness and decadence. I think we need to look at those family resemblances much, much more closely. The tiny minority of citizens who resolve their political hopes by becoming agents of eschatological terror don't do this because their culture or their faith inevitably disposes them towards that outcome. The decision to act violently may involve aesthetic elements as well as political responses. It may have been formed by protracted experiences of inequality um, that were combined with, um, with a high degree of cultural integration. And accounts of their own uh, murderous conduct provided by some of the recent perpetrators of the terror attacks suggest that they turned away indeed from barbarous ignorance of consumerism and towards a kind of virtue in their actions. Um, um, speaking uh, um, you know, of his own behaviour in the context of a just war theory as an ethical act, Mohammed Sadiq Khan is, of course, the most notable one of these voices. I think it's also important for us, and perhaps it's easier for you uh, because of your, your government's rather different choices, um, important for us to see that the lofty inclinations of these people seem to have been combined with a very simple rejection of our government's neo imperial action. Uh, that they try to answer the belligerence of, of our nation that refuses to acknowledge the post and neo-colonial dimensions of its global role, even, even when it's dealing with peoples whose memories are sharper and more attuned to the enduring impact of the imperial arrangements that created post-colonial states like Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Kenya, and of course Zimbabwe and South Africa. It bears repetition that the politics of race and national identity has been freshly tailored to the outline not of security, but of securitocracy. I should say one or two things briefly more about that. I see securitocracy as a model, a novel form of power and rule that carries a deep imprint of colonial statecraft into the present. In, uh, it's there in the merging of police and military power. It's there in the blur blurring of older metropolitan distinctions between inside and outside. Well, as I move towards my conclusion, I want to suggest to you that many of the dangers in this moment have been compounded by the institutional retreat of critical scholarship. Whatever its shortcomings, that project promised and often delivered a rich consideration of how cultures and their workings impacted on political consciousness and experience. I think the reversal um, there has been counterpointed by a second setback. Timid academics have withdrawn into the shelter provided by the disciplines they had fled from. Scholastic boundaries that have started to appear permeable, even residual, are once again being enthusiastically policed. Uh, and these changes, I think, fit very well with the mood of what I call shallow professionalization, which has diluted the intellectual life of our universities and is now pressurizing us into becoming appendages of corporate and governmental power that are unable to approach education as either a civic or a public good. It's either a corporate good or it's an individual good, but it's never a civil or a civic or a public good. And that dangerous moment is exactly the one in which a kind of race-friendly cultural law, again imported from the history of the United States, is starting to function as a kind of common sense or default setting. Their parochial solutions are being projected worldwide as the very best way to understand racialized politics, to govern the problems created by racial and hierarchy. That country's tale of successful settler colonialism has supplied foundational norms and debates about the perils of cultural heterogeneity, the negative impact of diversity and immigration, to our uh, Robert Putnam is practically living in 10 Downing Street, unfortunately. US history and political culture are used to generate ideal types that indicate the future for everyone else on Earth when it comes to race and racism. US derived models are advanced as if they reveal a desirable balance between discreetly separable civic and ethnic versions of nationalism. US racial technologies, identity politics, affirmative action, profiling are exported as a ready made solution to the issues problems discovered um, uh, under the signs of race 
Now, how we respond to these developments, it depends on how we interpret the confluence of culture talk and civilizationism. How we evaluate the patterns of cultural influence and combination of it around us, and how in particular we understand the significance of the premium that's being placed on cultural heterogeneity. My response to these problems is not necessarily to call for a better theory of cultural plurality, but I think that's needed. As you've seen, I wanted instead to draw attention to the patterns of convivial social interaction that are practiced ordinarily and routinely in everyday life in Europe's post-colonial cities. That everyday activity shifts the interpretive focus away from the cultural resources that precede events in the contact of zone, and attention gets directed instead towards opportunities and pleasures of habitual interaction, as well as its distinctive tempo. I think we have to reflect upon both the care that goes on in those and the conflict that is created uh, across the lines of culture. These interactions, positive and negative, destabilize the idea that <clears throat> contact with difference proceeds from sealed up or segregated ethnic enclaves, that it comes and flows from safe houses. Our labile politics are not mosaics. They're not composed of fragments that can be arranged into a national picture. We discover instead untidy patterns, cosmopolitan patterns, unruly desire, routine translation, and transcultural imagination. Even if it is articulated as a form of solidarity bound by gender, bound by class or locality, these uh, kinds of contexts might be recognized, I think, as productive. Um, but they, and I think they've generated a rich and civic and democratic interaction, especially uh, when racism and ethnic absolutism are identified and perhaps even territory, temporarily overcome. Excuse me. This is telling us that the US is not in advance of Europe on some grand teleological journey towards a successful management of alien incomers and the orchestration of their smooth transformation into uniform citizens. As we've seen, the argument that Europe must have a US-style racial future involves setting aside consideration of the histories of racial hierarchy that are buried there and disavowed in the way that history is circulated. If that sounds too harsh, I think we must immediately acknowledge that Europe has its own distinctive problems of melancholia and amnesia. Failure to work through the consequences of colonial rule and lost imperial prestige now renders many different uh, countries vulnerable to the country, um, it, it ought to be possible for you to entertain the idea that that very knowledge is what is motivating them to act against you. So it's very odd that you would disadvantage yourself with a complete ignorance of that history. And that is the case, certainly in my country. In a way, I think, I, you know, as a sociologist, if I can ever say that, I began to be interested in, in things like the sociology of knowledge. Now I'm not interested in the sociology of knowledge anymore. I'm interested in the sociology of ignorance. I'm interested actually in the cultural reproduction of particular kinds of ignorance, in the cultural context, in the historical context, in which particular patterns of ignorance are reproduced and institutionalized and formalized. And I think we need a better vocabulary for understanding that. We need a change of emphasis which enables us to see the production and orchestration of ignorance in, in, in a different pattern. And that means, I suppose, going back to Machiavelli and revising Machiavelli, you know, with the help of Edward Bernays and Freud and, 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 and a number of other people who are the architects and theorists of the info war, a war in which information is not something which is appended to the conflict in the way it was before, with a psychological operation of science. Here, that info is the war. That is the war itself. It's integral to that conflict. And in the info war, the imbalance of historical information is disadvantageous for any attempt to develop a global approach to justice and power and security. It reminds us that the world we share is not a blank sheet, that its boundaries were uh, established not only by the end of Soviet communism, but by the breakup of colonial structures, which have conditioned the architecture of economic and cultural globalization, as well as thwarted and widely uh, ridiculed rid rid desire for recognition of Europe's past crimes. Um, the unprocessed colonial past can intervene on many either sides of culture line, to make our political situation more hazardous and more intractable. An overdue coming to terms with the consequences of that departed colonial power is not just a way to make problems brought by racial hierarchies. It's also a way of bringing those difficult issues out of the official domain of culture 
and inside the proper world of politics. The argument that post-colonial minorities have illegitimately demanded special treatment is, for example, much less plausible when considered in the historical perspective, which admits more than just a kind of contingent connection between colony and metropole, based on incidental economic factors. I think we might even argue that European democracy has been enriched, would be enriched, I'm sorry, by facing up to the history of its debasement and its abbreviation in colonial statecraft. The application of industrial <coughs> technology inside Europe as part of exercises in racial hygiene become less than a sublime eruption of unfathomable evil then. That too might belatedly enter the realm of history. I want to emphasize that there are links between that healthier relationship to the imperial and colonial past and the vitality and sustainability of the multiculture which is developed in Europe and is worth defending now. The strategy for this ongoing work will vary from country to country, but of course most of those countries share a denial of the economic and political and cultural consequences of their vanished imperial and colonial phases. In Portugal, for example, um, um, the link between decolonization and the establishment of democracy seems to be a critical thing. The relationship of the colonial government to domestic fascism is, is, is relevant too. Political and legal continuity that linked undemocratic habits in national politics to imperial administration have to be discussed and debated. In France, the refusal to consider post-colonial dynamics as significant in any way has been amplified by the effects of that republican tradition and needs to be given an entirely new genealogy that runs through the colonial world, in my opinion. And of course here, you know, I mean, I don't like Ian Barum at all, but I'm deeply indebted to him for supplying some elements, some basic clues about what a locally oriented account of the larger social and cultural forces that made immigration into a permanent twilight condition. I've never understood here how you stop being an immigrant. It's always been amazing to me. It doesn't matter how long you're here, you're always still an immigrant. It's very mm -hmm. curious in particular, I think, to be here. In the Nordic countries, where there's something of the same, I think, approach, their past colonial adventures remain hidden, and their profit from the wars waged by others is something that they would prefer to ignore. The prominence of their politics, of their policies and theories advanced by commentators who see those states as proof of the value of homogeneity, and that will also, I think, have to be challenged. Although certainly in the case of Sweden, most of that is imported from the United States. It's the Jonathan Friedland people who say, well, I am embrace but nobody else is allowed to. Or, or Putnam, who gets given the great medal by the Swedish Academy for telling them how to keep their immigrants uh, under control. My country has blundered into this uneven but habitable multiculture only because our governments have been entirely absent from the process of making that multiculture. Patchy acknowledgments of the power of our imperial this during last year's commemorations of the passage of the legislation against the slave trade, have always had to struggle with this melancholic, deeply nationalistic, what I call the two world wars and one world cup mentality, which is what our, which is what our, what our uh, soccer fans chant, two world wars. And I think it's tuned really into the exigencies of our country's slow decomposition into its ethnic constituencies, whether they're invented or ancient. The elevation of security over other governmental functions is also part of this. And the novelty of that moment is confirmed by this unprecedented extent to which these, all these conflicts are seen to grow out of cultural difference. Today it's imperative that responses to the supposed insecurity of Europe's cultural resources are not going to be made continuous or even congruent with other geopolitical or economic anxieties. The temptation to indulge in all that kind of analysis has paralleled the rise of the securitocracy in the period since the clash of civilizations was first projected as a framework capable of connecting the riots in Paris, the murder of Van Gogh, the Danish cartoons, and the war in Mesopotamia. The hidden component driving on all these deliberations is a great need, I think, to specify exactly who will now count as a European, or what that attachment is going um, to involve in today's insecure and unsettling conditions. So instead of reading and writing and creating and debating in order to discover who we are and what we must become, we've been asked to establish and then to enforce a fixed identity as the precondition for attachment to national states, as the starting point for any pursuit of that ephemeral universality which has been its historic counterpart. Of course, a particular set of ethnic, ethnocentric judgments around sex and sexuality, progress and tolerance, supplies this arbitrary benchmark for these calculations. 
But across Europe, there are very few ideologues of that simple-minded multiculturalism to be seen. There simply are no advocates of facile relativism queuing up to argue for the absolute incorrigibility of discrepant cultural formations. Um, partisans for multicultural and diversity turn out to be rather hard to look at. Few intellectuals, apart from those who are themselves migrants, are prepared to sacrifice their hard-won seriousness so cheaply. And the politicians worked out long ago they had nothing to gain from espousing this unpopular cause. So, let me conclude by returning critically to the idea that to function optimally, national states have to be based upon that obvious, that facile sameness, which is amenable to being engineered from above. The view which says the more homogeneity the better, though the precise scale on which those arguments are supposed to operate is seldom made explicit. I've suggested, I've suggested in Britain anyway, that the homegrown terrorist has displaced the economic migrant, the asylum seeker and the refugee to become the conventional avatar of insecurity. Among the xenophobes and their foes, the appeal of certainty and hierarchy and closed or fortified ways of life seems to be connected with components borrowed from a familiar generic version of revolutionary conservatism, ultranationalism and populism. Adapters, adherents and practitioners of these ideologies may not even be aware of the history of the gestures they have been repeating. These convergences, these borrowings and reloadings constitute an uncomfortable reminder that the rifts and fissures within civilizations account for more than the supposedly unbridgeable gulf between them. The idea that these conflicts are best grasped as existing between contending cultures is, as I hope I've explained, utterly misplaced, just as the understanding of culture as a rigid ethnic marker is now entirely, entirely unmoded.